Welcome to lecture number two. In, in this lecture, we're going to talk about stress and strain in engineering structures. The first thing I do is I show you here this picture of the Morandi Bridge, which is in Genoa, Italy, and it collapsed on August 14th of 2018 and killed 43 people in the process. The span that is missing right in here, let me see if I can actually, it fell some 150 feet down to the uh, neighborhood below it, actually. Now, why did this happen? It happened because people failed to heed the warnings of the bridge ins inspectors. The Morandi Bridge is a classic cable-stayed bridge where there are vertical support towers. I'm just going to draw those representative here. And then from the support towers, the bridge sections are cantilevered out from those. And then those cantilever sections are supported by what are called cable stays. So this is a cable stay bridge. And the unique thing about the Morandi Bridge is there were a bunch of steel cables that were encased in concrete. And so you know that the load that's applied to the bridge is going to be transferred up through these cables into the tower, which creates compression in this central tower. Well, the problem is the cables were embedded in cement and that precluded inspection of the cables. Over time, through weathering, the cement cracked, water got in, rusted the cables, and the structural integrity of the cables was degrading over time. They knew this was happening. They knew they had to replace the bridge, but it's pretty hard to muster the will of the people to increase taxes to pay to fix things. You will note that this bridge was finished in 1967, and there are a lot of bridges throughout the developed world that were built around that time frame. Okay, so when we design something, it's pretty clear here when we design this, that we need to know the forces that are going to be acting on the structure. Because of that, there's no avoiding it. We have to create free body diagrams. And so that's gonna be a big part of what we do in engineering design. Once we understand the forces that are acting, we have to create the structures to support those forces. That involves not only sizing the structural components, but selecting the materials that you're going to use. It's really important that you understand exactly how this structure, this machine, this component is going to be used. Is it going to be used in a corrosive environment? a protected environment? Is it going to be used continuously? How long is it supposed to last? All of those things affect the choices that you make, and we are going to learn the basic mechanics necessary to make those choices. So first up, though, when we do any kind of structural design whatsoever, is we need to understand the forces that are acting. And so free body diagrams are an essential part of all structural machine design. This is an example of a sort of rudimentary gearbox that is included in the textbook. You will notice that this gearbox has a mounting plane here and it has four identical bolts, one, two, three, and four at positions E, F, H, and I. There is an input shaft that runs to an input gear, which is called gear one. That is, uh, a motor is attached to that shaft and is applying 240 inch-pounds of torque. That gear one meshes with gear two right here, and it provides an output torque. Now, if everything ru is running at constant speed, then this structure is in static equilibrium, and so the rules of statics will apply to it so we can calculate all the forces that are acting. Now, what we need to know are, what are all the forces acting on the bolts? What are the forces acting on the shafts? What are the forces acting on the gears? You can imagine that we need to know all of this because we have to select the bolts, we have to design the outer structure, we have to choose the diameter of the shafts, we have to select the gears that are going to be used, we have to support those shafts with bearings. This shaft, the upper shaft is A, B, you'll note. The lower shaft is C, D. We have bearings in here so that those shafts can freely rotate. Those bearings are going to have forces acting on them, which are shown over here. And those forces that are acting are what will be required in order for us to select the bearings that we will use to support the shafts. Now, shaft A, B, this upper shaft right here, is shown in this particular diagram down below. That's the input shaft. The output shaft is shaft C, D. Shaft 
AB has gear one on it, shaft CD has gear two on it, and those two gears are in mesh, and so the teeth are transmitting forces from one gear to the other. You'll learn more about this as you move into ME329, but the force does not occur normal to the gear tooth. If I were to just draw a big gear tooth here, and that gear tooth is interacting with another gear tooth in the mating meshing gear, then you would see that the, the line of action at the contact point is inclined at what is called a pressure angle, which is the normal pressure angle, phi sub n. In this case, they're specifying that pressure angle to be 20 degrees. And so what that means is that a force is acting on gear one, it's being applied through gear two, equal and opposite, same force inclined at the pressure angle of 20 degrees, 20 degrees over here as well. And that is the tooth force that is acting on the gears. You can imagine you're transmitting torque, you gotta choose the gears so that the teeth can handle the load. And you need to know how that tooth force is related to the input torque, which we specified here is 240 inch pounds, because that's gonna determine the magnitude of that tooth force Force. The magnitude of that tooth force is going to determine the reactions that are acting on the shaft in order to keep it in place. Those reaction forces are again acting the housing for the gearbox. They are acting at positions A and C and B and D. All of that has to be known so that you can go ahead and size all of the components so that it doesn't fail under the action of those forces. Let's analyze the forces that are acting on the shaft. The first shaft that we're going to consider is the input shaft. It has the input torque of 240 inch pounds, which is acting, x axis is aligned with that shaft and it's acting in the negative x direction. So we have an input torque right here of 240 inch pounds in the negative i direction. The only thing that is countering that torque, if this is in equilibrium where we are no longer accelerating, the only thing that can counter that torque and which provides transmission of that torque through the transmission is this tooth force right here. So that tooth force has a pressure angle of 20 degrees and the tangential force F, I'll call that FT, that's the tangential force, is going to be equal to F times the cosine of 20 degrees. That multiplied by the radius of gear one, so Ft times R1 is going to be providing the counter torque to the input torque of 240 inch pounds. So if we know what R1 is, then we can find the tangential force that's acting on the gear tooth. The tangential force would be 240 inch-pounds divided by R1, but we know that R1 is 0.75 inches. And so we find that the torque is 240, 320. So we find that the tangential force, Ft, is 320 inch-pounds. Now that you have that tangential force, you can find the normal force. How do you do that? Well, the tangential force is the tooth force times cosine of 20 degrees. So the tooth force is going to be the tangential divided by cosine of 20 degrees. So that tooth force that's acting, what is it acting? It's acting normal to the face of the tooth. We divide that by cosine of 20 de degrees, and we get that the perpendicular to the face of the gear tooth is 340 pounds, so that the normal force, which is pushing the two gears apart, is equal to force F times the sine of 20 degrees, so it's just 340 pounds sine 20, so the normal force N is 116.5 pounds. So now we have the normal force and the tangential force, which is acting on the tooth. We now have everything we need to solve for equilibrium. So we take a look at that shaft. We just draw a representation of that shaft and realize that we have bearings at position A and position B, and that we have a gear that I'm representing here that has a tangential force of 320 pounds and a normal force of 116.5 pounds. And I just noticed that I have a mistake right here. 
that tangential force should not be in inch pounds. We divide it by inches, so we turn the inch pound into pounds. Okay, so we have these forces that are acting. We now have to deal with y and the reactions in the y and the z directions. You'll notice that I've drawn both of these reactions in the negative sense, reaction at b in the y and reaction at b in the z direction. And we just use some of the forces, some of the moments to determine the reaction forces. If we use some of the forces and some of the moments, we can solve for RAY, RAZ, RBY, and RBZ. Once we have those reactions, we could then also realize that where the two gears mesh together, we have equal and opposite forces. So I know that my normal force on shaft two is going to be 116.5 pounds. My tangential force on shaft two is 320 pounds. And we can use that to find the torque output. How do we find that? Torque output is going to be the tangential tooth force, 320 pounds, multiplied by the radius of gear two, which is 1.5 inches. And that gives me an output torque of 320 times 1.5. That's 480 inch pounds. So there's my output torque. Now I could go back and figure out what the forces are that are acting on the bolts. Remember we had those four bolts and those four bolts, if they're all of the same cross-sectional area, they will have a moment about the centroid of the bolt pattern. Each one of those, uh, so, so those bolts have to counter both the input and output torque. So the net torque is going to be the sum of the input plus the output torque, and we said that the input torque was 240 inch-pounds, and the output torque we calculated as 480 inch-pounds, so we end up with 720 inch-pounds of torque, which must be countered by the bolts that are at the four corners of the transmission mounting flange. There are some assumptions that you have to make in order to uh, determine what those bolt forces are. If all the bolts have the same cross-sectional area, then they equally share the torque load. And so we would just draw vector forces that are perpendicular to the radius from the group centroid. And we find that the net moment, they would all be the same force. So the bolt force, four times the bolt force times their respective distances from the centroid would be equal to the net torque, and that allows us to calculate the bolt forces.